us to have this delegation uh, at this particular stage. And uh, I think the format that you have decided is quite, uh, quite feasible and very, very useful. Uh, I'm sure that this will help us to at least form a better impression of how things are evolving and what the lessons to be learned are. Uh, I don't think I'll say very much at this stage, uh, except to uh, welcome the, uh, the various participants at, for today's meeting on the Chinese side, as well as from the Indian side. And we hope that we will have uh, a fairly fruitful and useful discussion. With that, I'll uh, hand over to you, uh, uh, Colonel Cho, uh, to carry on the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Nambia. It's uh, really great to see you. Uh, uh, I know the master to China when I was a staff officer yeah, at, during your tenure. And it's also great to see uh, uh, Ambassador Kansa, uh, whom uh, I met briefly. And uh, I'm also great, uh, happy to see Mono Josh. Uh, we met in Shagrila Dialogue and during your visit to China, you wrote uh, a few lines on me and I quoted you a few, a few lines of you in my uh, latest uh, opinion. And uh, it's great to see other Indian friends. Uh, so that, uh, it's really, really a great honor for us to have this uh, bilateral meetings uh, on ways ahead, especially given what the most uh, unpleasant incident happened between our two great countries. Uh, I think the discussion is really worthwhile. And besides, I would really thank all of you from Indian side to participate in this seminar uh, given the pandemic situation back in India. Uh, to my knowledge, some of you have uh, also have uh, uh, suffered losses, uh, be it uh, your relatives uh, or your friends. Uh, so we in China strongly sympathize with this. Uh, we just sincerely hope and pray uh, the pandemic will be over. And we also hope China's Josh. contribution might contribute a little oh. to easing the situation. With all this, yeah, let me uh, stop here and uh, let me I, directly. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Hemant has already, has he already uh, been able to establish audio contact? Hemant? No, I don't hear that. So I don't know whether we should start away straight away uh, then uh, with the uh, agenda as proposed and the questions list which has been proposed by the Chinese side. And uh, according to that, uh, opening uh, the opening remarks having already been uh, been uh, done, uh, I think perhaps uh, Senior Colonel Joe could probably start on the first question. Would you would you like me to start, or would you like to start off? Please uh, let me know. Well, uh, Ambassador, since you are more senior, I would prefer you to <laughs> to say uh, whatever you want to say within about five minutes, and then I'll just reciprocate. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, well, I think I'll probably speak, yeah, let me speak, start, start straight away. And uh, <clears throat> uh, to talk about the question, the first question, uh, I, inevitably for a person like me, as you said, uh, uh, I would like to, the starting point for, for certainly for a, a diplomat of my vintage would have to be the Rajiv Gandhi Teng Xiaoping meeting in December 1988. Uh, you know, incidentally, uh, I don't know whether, whether my own colleagues here know that that meeting with Teng Xiaoping on the Indian side, only two other people had joined and I was one of them. Even the foreign minister and the foreign secretary were not present at that meeting. Uh, it's, it's very interesting and very curious fact of history. Rajiv Gandhi decided to go alone with two people, one his own sec joint secretary and myself, uh, uh, <clears throat> more in terms of my knowledge of Chinese at that stage. But actually the essence of what uh, the senior leader of China had to convey, was conveyed at the press, uh, the very public handshake at the Great Hall of People besides that, besides before the meeting. And it was clear that his main point was that the 21st century cannot be a nation century unless the growth and prosperity of both China and India was assured, was ensured. And for that, he said the two must cooperate in building such a nation century. Now, <clears throat> I believe that the senior leader Teng Xiaoping was sincere in his belief that trust and cooperation could be built between the two countries. Of course, <clears throat> there were major differences and he asked that all these should be pursued, uh, particularly through by building people to people relations. 
that time, of course, that was 1988, and the gap between the GDP gap between China and India at that time was still reasonable. Today, the situation has changed exponentially. The IMF puts the 2020 Chinese PPP GDP figure at roughly 24.2 trillion, as compared to even the US 20.8 trillion, making China the largest in the world. Now, <clears throat> a Price Waterhouse Cooper forecast in 2017 estimated that China's GDP in uh, 2050 would be around 59 trillion. Now, these are big figures. Of course, they also talked about India as being in second place. That was before the pandemic. We don't know how much that will change India, uh, India's figures in, uh, as we go along. But obviously, GDP is not everything. It is, however, an important measure of a country's comprehensive national strength. That said, it is also a reality that in per capita terms today, China's GDP is still less than one-fifth that of the US, and India's is a little more than one-fifth that of China. As of today, therefore, the US still remains a single superpower. What does all this tell us? In India, over the years, we have been looking for a realistic coping strategy vis-a-vis -vis our relations with China. And I think that had to take account of three factors. India should, cannot, and should, uh, could not afford today to fight an all-out war with China. Neither side could afford to lose in such an encounter. Our strategy, of course, has had, always had to be to avoid such a drawn-out conflict. While on the one hand, <clears throat> we did, we have to have this concern, <clears throat> and we continue to have some major trust problems with China, in the current world, it is not possible for us to wall ourselves up from China and have nothing to do with it. The world is inter interconnected. And I think the very fact of the difference, when I was ambassador in China in 2000, our bilateral trade was in fact under 2 billion. Today, it's, in 2018, it was 95 billion. That itself uh, gives you the, uh, tells you how interconnected we are. At the same time, the third point is India cannot be a satellite of any power. There's no way in which that can happen. Our self-image cannot tolerate such a status. Now, our coping strategy, therefore, vis-a-vis -vis the outside world, has to take account of these fundamental realities. Now, let me just talk of four milestones between those days and these and today. The first is the 1993 uh, Peace and Tranquility Agreement when Narasimha Rao visited Beijing. Now, <clears throat> that, of course, committed both sides to a clarification of the LAC alignment. Now, in 1996, the first ever visit of, the Chinese, of a Chinese president to India took place when President Jiang Zemin visited and we had the agreement on confidence building measures. Just as an aside, I might add that we were also impressed. I was impressed by the fact that not just in, our, in the visit to India, but in a, in a visit to Pakistan, President Jiang spoke to the, Pakistan, the Pakistani Senate and talked about using the same uh, perspective of setting aside differences that informed India-China relations, he asked Pakistan in Indo-Pakistani differences to set the differences aside and move for normal state-to-state -state relations. That, of course, didn't work. Uh, we, it hasn't worked so far. With China, uh, of course, we've had ups and downs in our relationship after the nuclear test explosion. Of course, uh, by June two, 2000, President Narayanan was able to, to uh, visit China, and we managed to more or less even the relations. And it's interesting that during the Kargil problems, President Zhu Rungji's visit to President, uh, meeting with uh, Prime Minister, Pakistani Prime Minister, helped, among other things, to bring that conflict to a reasonable end. Now, this, the third point, the third uh, milestone, as it were, was the 2005 peace and uh, political parameters and guiding principles for solving the boundary agreement, which talked about settled populations in border areas, etc. And finally, of course, the fourth milestone was uh, President Xi Jinping's five points, uh, which talked about better communication, expanding investment, 
helping each other and working, cooperating in multilateral fora and, of course, accommodating core concerns on both sides. Now, for India, peace and tranquility on the LSE was a core concern. And even though we've had serious border boundary tensions in 2013 in Debsang, Chumar, and later on in uh, 2017 in Doklam, we had thought that these could be handled through maintenance of proper chemistry between our top leaders. Now, the bloody clashes in Galwan in June 2020 has actually changed all that. Quite frankly, uh, this is, it has been a, it's been a monumental change. It is difficult to identify the motivations behind the Chinese decision to breach the peace at that time. Indian Foreign Minister Jay Shankar had said in December last year that China had given five differing explanations behind this policy change. Now, it could be anything, perhaps India's brusque rejection of the BRI refusal to attend the April 2019 summit, so-called strategic adjustments in India's major power diplomacy, or even turns and twists in our national politics may have been the subject of this, as many of uh, Chinese scholars have been talking about. But there can be no doubt that the confrontation with India was pre-planned and with an intent to cause a major rupture. We sense that it was to teach India a lesson. What kind of a lesson we must actually analyze. Uh, <clears throat> but within the country, within India, it caused an avalanche of anger, mistrust, and subliminal suspicions against China. Of course, by standing their ground in the main, main areas of confrontation and tactical, making tactical moves in other areas, and generally in refusing to be provoked, our troops have shown firmness and sobriety. Now, <clears throat> there are talks continuing for de-escalation, but the war, as it were, of psychological attrition continues in many ways, at least it is being felt in India. How do we cope with this situation? Now, our experience with the past, I think, provides some pointers. And I think we now have sensed that we will need to make clear to China that we have options in the political, military, trade, economic, and science and technology fields, and we shall exercise them without inhibition and without agonizing over how China will react. We also realize that personal chemistry has limits. Two, at the same time, we are prepared, and I think we should be prepared to keep our communication with the Chinese at all levels open. Three, while we are aware that deception and perhaps even deceit may be part of the Chinese toolkit, and we may, while we must be vigilant, we shall not follow in such a track, and we should be prepared to make our own reactions and responses predictable, credible, and transparent. On the border, while striving to keep the military situation under control, we should be prepared to use countervailing force if required. Now, over the longer term, how will we, how, how, what, we should, what should be the lessons we should learn? One, we should ensure a freezing of the LAC along an alignment closest to the current one with patrolling protocols that are sustainably defensible. Now, too, we need to find alternate supply chains on important products on which India is critically dependent in China in order to reduce our vulnerability in the long run. And this accounts for the Make in India and the Atmanirbhar Bharat projects, etc. Three, while India feels compelled to locate alternate areas of counter pressure through closer ties with the US, other Quad partners and with Europe, as well as with countries in our immediate neighborhood, we must also be prepared to look beyond binaries and look at opportunities to work with China to promote peace in the neighborhood in areas, I think, uh, in even in, uh, including Afghanistan and Myanmar, where major issues of regional stability and transnational threats may be involved. Now, we are all aware, as uh, External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar has said, the world is becoming an increasingly complex place, and India's diplomacy needs to be multiple, um, must, to, uh, come, must rely on multiple approaches and multiple alliances to concentrate on convergence with many 
but congruence with none and keeping all the balls or many balls up in the air. I think that what Jay Shankar has mentioned in his, in, in, in most recently in terms of the Chinese idiom, the three mutuals and the eight propositions, I think will remain an abiding template for us now. I think these are the broad points which I need to make and I think I'll stop there, there straight away. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, you truly talk like a good ambassador at a strategic level and down to every good details. And uh, although you have uh, talked uh, slightly over time, but I do understand that uh, that is no problem. Uh, now, let me come straight to what I consider how we should uh, manage a crisis in terms of what happened in uh, Governor Valley last year. First of all, never again. Well, this is not a rhetoric. Well, it's really, really uh, sad for me, a staff officer who has spent uh, 10 years of his whole life uh, in South Asia to see what has happened, especially after uh, both uh, the leadership of uh, happily said that we had uh, not fired a single bullet uh, for four decades. Uh, well, uh, 1990s happened to be the golden age of uh, crisis management uh, between China and India. We actually have signed five agreements, and that happened to be my very first time to work in South Asia. Uh, and uh, even during the uh, counter operation in the Gulf of Aden, since I'm the coordinator, I have thanked the Indian delegation uh, on behalf of PLA for their effort in rescuing Chinese merchant ship Food City in 2011. So if we cannot solve this problem uh, of a border dispute, this, such disputes are simply ubiquitous around the world. We should set an example of how great powers could coexist in spite of the problem. Uh, well, I disagree with uh, Ambassador uh, Ram uh, Rambia, however, that uh, this is a pre-planned uh, by China. This is definitely accidental. Think of this with a conventional wisdom. If we plan this, why should we just uh, fight against the Indian soldiers with the feast and the wooden clubs? And we also have uh, casualties on our side. The border itself is not demarcated, and this is not the first time for us to have standoffs. So this time it simply uh, become the more valid. It's not at all that China has pre-planned for this kind of a, uh, incident or accident. Uh, second thing is, in spite of the, the crisis, we in China always see the positive developments. In this, I would say that uh, it's good that we haven't shoot at each other, although the Indian side has shoot into the sky to give warning. This is dangerous because this might cause miscalculation from Chinese side. But anyway, we can still conclude that uh, the great conclusion that not a single bullet is fired across the border is still established. So what to do uh, in the days to come? I think uh, what is different is that uh, uh, we had uh, a major general level meeting of many rounds, and this is unprecedented. This laid a good foundation or our bilateral withdrawal from the region. Therefore, we should uh, make this uh, established uh, to have a more senior officer level uh, regular meeting. Besides, the two sides should have uh, the hotlines, at least uh, between the neighboring military regions. It's interesting for me to say that China has established hotlines with many countries, uh, uh, neighboring countries, but it's uh, <laughs> strange uh, for a uh, us who have a, a territorial dispute not to have a hotline until now. Uh, so this situation should definitely be changed. The sooner, the better. Uh, another thing is the bordering troops should have regular meetings and uh, mutual visits. This is already mentioned uh, in the uh, uh, border defense uh, cooperation of 2013. Uh, therefore, uh, we should uh, uh, continue to do this. Both of us have already done something in line with agreements, such as joint celebration of, of, a, of a, a bilateral national military days or festival, non-contact sports events, or even joint military training exercises. But we should uh, do more, as noted, for example, to have exchange information. And we should continue uh, 
uh, joint working group at diplomatic and military levels. For example, uh, this is what we did in 1990. We should continue to do this to comb through all the five agreements we have established. Because if I look at the five agreements, what, what is my conclusion? My conclusion is we have more agreements than uh, China with any other countries. With the United States, we have just the three, and with India, we have five. And it's surprising to see how detailed these companies' big measures are in these uh, five agreements, but many of them are not implemented, starting from uh, the verification of line of action control, which is documented in the first document, up to many other details. So we should start to comb through them and start from the easy, uh, the, the, the low-hanging fruits, to see where we can achieve. Do we need more agreements? I don't think so. If we look at how detailed these agreements are, but besides, we should of course have CBMs, more CBMs, like exchange of troops, like hotline, these are something supplementary. Uh, so this is essentially what I want to say, and hopefully we can have a, a new future. Thank you. Now, shall we uh, come directly into discussion? Yeah. Very good. Would anybody, would Hemant like to make a, make any? Hemant, can you can you hear us now? Yeah, uh, but am I audible? Yes. Yes. It is quite clear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. My apologies first for um, joining late because of this audio problem, which was not in my control. Um, uh, good morning to everyone. I've, I've heard both Ambassador Namka and Colonel Chopo. Uh, my only uh, uh, starting point of uh, uh, asking a question would be that looking at the India-China relations uh, since uh, the two countries became independent and liberated, uh, and especially since the uh, 2000, the frequency of the conflicts or the standoffs which have been taking place. Uh, maybe I would like both of you to comment that the overall framework in which the India-China relations or bilateral relations operate today, the overall situation or the framework is defined by three factors. One, it is local disputes. Two, it is regional antagonisms and third, uh, colonial past. I mean, you can choose the order of preference of the three factors the way you like, but my preference uh, of the order would be uh, local disputes, regional antagonisms, and colonial past. So unless we have some kind of a uh, clarity of perspective on these three factors, uh, of course, uh, it's nice to hear that uh, you know, we regret what happened last June or what has been happening in the past. And it's nice to hear to say that we wish it never happens again. Uh, your comments, please. Well, Hermann, maybe I can say something first. Uh, of all what I said just now, they are uh, my personal tangible pro propositions in line with the five agreements already met. So the, the whole question uh, between China and India is to develop this relationship while keeping the uh, dispute along the line of action control under control. So how uh, have we, uh, well, you see, there is uh, a greater truth in what the Indian side said about the uh, line of action control uh, in its uh, great role in a bilateral relationship. But if we a look at the bilateral relationship. It's exactly because uh, the Indian side, starting with the Rajiv Gandhi's visit to China in 1988, as Ambassador mentioned just now, we have actually put aside this border uh, issue and let the other aspects of this relationship thrive and flourish. Uh, therefore, uh, this border issue reminds us again, we really need to pay attention uh, to our border dispute. Because China's approach and the Indian approach are almost upside down. The Indian approach is more bottom-up, 
yeah, to verify the line of energy control, while China would take the uh, uh, top-down approach, uh, asking for a mutual accommodation, uh, which apparently is not really accepted by the Indian side. So on this whole border issue, in terms of a verification line of action and control, I do not believe it's feasible uh, in the near future. But at least we can do a lot of, lot of things in line with the five agreements to make sure that this would never happen again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Colonel Chopo. If I just take one minute to intervene here before Ambassador Nambiar responds to my question. Um, if, you, if you recall what I said in my quick question, it was not addressed specifically to either China or India. I mean, I'm not putting uh, blame on China or India for this. What I'm saying is that if in 70 years, as you just now said, if in 70 years or after 70 years, today we are not even uh, willing to agree to uh, start, have a starting point where both of us agree to negotiate on the border dispute, then uh, uh, what are we to do? If 70 years have not led us to this point, then what are we to do? This is my question to both India and China. Uh, Ambassador Nambiar may respond, please. Well, I think I think I, I take your point that you know that we should have been able to come come up to some kind of a some kind of an understanding of how to proceed after seventy years in terms of understanding each other's positions. Now, you talked about colonial past, regional antagonisms, and local disputes. Of course, you mentioned it in the other way. Now, I think there has been so much discussion on these in the course of the determination of how that these three aspects should inform our bilateral relations that I think it's, we just have been talking past each other, but yet there have been several areas, several uh, occasions when we have been able to address each of these things in a, in a manner where despite the fact that our basic perceptions may not be identical, they not, may not even be a major convergence in terms of those basic uh, perspectives. There has been a possibility of being able to proceed forward despite certain differences and nuance in terms of our appreciation of what, how the colonial past informs the present, how regional interests of each country uh, in a sense overlaps with the other and how we should, how we should make some allowances in order to be able to coexist in that and how local disputes can actually be handled in a manner that their differences do not become disputes. And I think it has happened in the past and there is no reason why this shot should not have continued in the future. And that is where, in fact, what uh, uh, Colonel uh, Cho has mentioned about the fact that we had a creditable record of not having fired a single bullet for so many decades. And I think that is an important uh, sign of the capacity on, of both countries at each level, at all levels. In fact, at the, at the, at the central level, at the, at the level of the top leadership and at the level of the, uh, of the forces on the ground. I think there has been a commendable amount of sobriety, self-discipline in their being able not to avoid us, to, uh, not to uh, let uh, the, you know, the, let's say the compulsions uh, at, at local level to, in, uh, to result in escalation. And I think that has happened a lot. And that is why in many ways, what happened in Galwan is not understandable entirely. And while, you know, while I think this, it is true that, uh, that, uh, that the, 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 there was no firing in that sense, but the very fact that the, the nature of the exchange uh, gives rise to a fair amount of difficulty on our side to understand how this could have escalated in such a manner. And unless this is tied up with some sense of wanting to establish a point, wanting to, in a sense, you know, to, to, uh, to drive home a point and, in a sense, uh, send a lesson, there is really no other interpretation. Now, it is possible for us to, to say, obviously, the Chinese side would also have seen provocations on the Indian side. I'm sure that that is probably the uh, also uh, is a possibility. 
But the fact is that there has not been, in a, there has always been a sense that the two sides should sit down and try and work out the, our own understanding of where the LAC, and to, to that extent, I fail to understand also fully the reasons why the exact alignment of the line of actual control has not been possible. It is true that there may have been, there, there may be uh, a sense that once you establish the line, the, the establishment of the line itself is a highly political question. It will be, of course it will be. But at the same time, it is clearly understood that this is separate from the boundary. And I think even if it is a fiction, I think that fiction must be, pers must be, must be at least uh, uh, allowed to persist because that is the only way in which by detailed coordinates exchanging of maps on the two sides, that is the only way in which we can prevent each side's patrolling limits, et cetera, being established in a manner where it doesn't provoke uh, a kind of action, uh, military action on the other side. And I think that at the local level, this probably it's, it's the only truly effective way in which we can avoid future conflict. Regional uh, uh, sort of uh, antagonisms, I think that that is the stuff of diplomacy. I don't know if we can we can have problems of you know in terms of how the Chinese will be conducting their their diplomacy with uh, with uh, the with either Nepal or but there have been occasions when we have been able to show an understanding in terms of larger problems and accommodate each other's concerns in a manner which did not bring uh, <clears throat> any kind of direct uh, antagonism or confrontation. Uh, in a manner, both political or mainly political in relation to our neighbors. And I think some of the things which are now facing us, particularly in Afghanistan and Myanmar, I think would be important for both countries in order to address uh, a situation of state stabilization in both of these places. And I think it is important for us to understand that. Now, in terms of the, of the overall colonial past and things like that, here again, our understanding of what the past has implied uh, in terms of our relationship with say, uh, our, our, our understandings with regard to Tibet, uh, in terms of uh, our relationship and the, the policies which we have pursued vis-a-vis -vis the Dalai Lama have been in a sense, uh, there is a, a, an element of nuance which, uh, has, which, the China, which China has not been uh, willing to accept because we have talked about our cultural ties with, uh, with uh, the Dalai Lama and that has been misunderstood. And I think in some ways it has also, uh, <clears throat> I think our, our own political forces here have not been above trying to manipulate those, those kind of understandings to press it to an extreme where it has actually, uh, it has actually proved to be uh, almost antagonistic to Chinese interests and that is happening. And I think it is important for us to be increasingly careful about how we handle that. I think these, uh, following the fact that over the years we have managed to, to at least maintain a certain balance, I think it is important for us to understand that this balance can be, it should not be pushed towards an extreme. And at the same time, we must recognize that as China becomes more and more powerful, I think it would want closure on some of these issues. And that closure will have to be at China's terms. And I think that is what is creating the current kind of uh, uh, problems and uh, uh, let's say uh, brazenness, uh, uh, abrasiveness as it were in the relations. And I think that we'll have to see how we can manage, how we can uh, in a sense uh, uh, cope with that without leading to outright uh, conflict or by the political or even armed conflict. I don't know if that answers some of your your uh, your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you sir. Uh, um, if I may uh, uh, be excused just for a one second comment to Ambassador Nambiar's uh, reply. Uh, after listening to Ambassador Nambiar, I'm reminded of a Russian uh, saying, uh, which is that uh, trying to uh, settle future on the basis of uncertain past. Thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> okay. thank you, Hermann, for your comments. We are just uh, uh, over time for one minute, but uh, one minute, uh, one minute. But let me just uh, briefly uh, comment on what Ambassador said just now regarding uh, 
uh, what I heard, the exchange of maps. And I remember this because after we come into agreement in 1990, we have decided to exchange maps to find out, first of all, what are the position of the two sides. But in such a practice, we in China realize that uh, uh, in, at least in the Western sectors, uh, there are many, many areas uh, where new disputes raised by India have cropped up. So, so this actually is not a, a solution to the problem, but actually it has added more problems. So uh, I believe uh, this kind of verification of line of action control currently on the current atmosphere and given the stock difference in our uh, position is not quite viable at this time. But still, well, the five agreements are what the, the two governments have actually signed, have agreed to. Therefore, we could actually find more rooms uh, inside them. If we look at the, uh, the agreements, we would say how detailed they are. For example, in 1996, uh, it included uh, limiting the re respect the military forces to minimum level. Right now, we're just raising the level. And uh, we, we should limit a major category of, of uh, armament, such as combat tanks, even the combat vehicles. Now, they're just uh, yeah, getting up there, right? And we should also avoid holding large-scale military exercises involving uh, more than one division in close proximity of line of action control. So there are so many, so many rooms to maneuver for us. We should really come through what we have already agreed. On disagreement right now, it's difficult for us to find a way out. Thank you. So maybe uh, since we are about uh, three minutes ahead uh, already, uh, 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 the in time. Shall we come uh, uh, next to the next agenda? Uh, that is question two. How India views PLA's presence in the notion, quotation, areas of cooperation or conflict, or how the Chinese South China Sea might play a role in India's uh, Act East policy. In this regard, I try to put, uh, you know, our concern and your concern uh, in parallel and, and ask uh, how our experts may just uh, find uh, some middle ground. Uh, so with uh, this, let me invite, uh, first of all, Dr. Manoj Josh to say a few words, please, within five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes. yes. OK. Well, <clears throat> I won't spend time on detailing the importance of the Indian Ocean in terms of population, trade, etc. Everyone knows that it's a, a hugely important uh, area. Now, there was a time when India used to look with alarm at all external actors in the Indian Ocean. Partly this had to do with our experience in 1971, the US intervention during the Bangladesh war. But now the Indian posture has changed with the understanding that the Indian Ocean region is far too important a channel of commerce and trade for many powers and hence their interests in sea lane security and stability also. But you know, the, given the geography, Indian Peninsula, which juts out 2,000 kilometers into the ocean and is central to the developments of the ocean, India feels that it has a special responsibility for its security and stability. 40%, uh, I think, of world seaborne trade passes through Malacca. And as that is known, that very proximate to Indian island territories uh, 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 near the Malacca Straits. Now, the current Indian policy has been laid out by Prime Minister Modi in a major speech in Mauritius in 2015. And he looked at five issues ranging from security of the Indian mainland to cooperation with maritime state, uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, infrastructure development, tourism, etc., etc. Uh, Prime Minister gave the acronym SAGAR, which means C in Hindi and stands for security and growth for all in the region. Essentially, it means that India recognizes that extra regional nations also have interests and stakes in the Indian Ocean region. Now, China obviously has extensive interests in the IOR and it's literal, and it is natural for China to be concerned about the security and stability of the region as well. China is the most important trading partner of the Indian Ocean region uh, in 2017 and accounted for 16.1% of the total goods trade. And this was 16.1% uh, in 2017, which was up from 4.8% in 2000. In this period, the trade of the Indian Ocean region with other areas like US and EU actually began to decline. 
this is the uh, level of the uh, china also of course hugely uh, hugely reliant on the oil uh, that passes through the indian ocean for its energy security then it comes to when india and china both had to rescue citizens from yemen in 2015 in a zone where there was fighting so this is another area where there is a natural chinese interest the middle east is a volatile area and this is not the first time india has had to evacuate Uh, its citizens i think in yemen this that is the first time the chinese evacuated their citizens now there are two entities that seek to provide cooperative security and stability in the indian, indian ocean region right now the first is the indian ocean rim association a grouping of 23 countries which border the ocean you know they look at maritime safety security trade hadr various uh, aspects uh, look even including economic growth and technology transfer they have a one track 1.5 indian ocean dialogue now china us uk <coughs> japan are dialogue partners of the indian ocean rim association the second institution is the indian ocean naval symposium 24 member group based on countries of the indian ocean and again china is an observer along with J japan germany italy madagascar etc now the iohns was first held in 2008 with india as a host and since then meetings have been taking place uh, every two years i'm mentioning these institutions because these are the institutions upon which uh, peace and tranquility and stability of the indian ocean uh, you have a ready made architecture uh, another institution which has been created by india is the information fusion center at uh, gurgaon which is part of the indian navy's information management and analysis system This is basically dealing with white shipping uh, information. So the idea is that, given its geography, India becomes a maritime information hub for the region, and also focus on coastal shipping, because for us, because we had a major terrorist attack um, with ter terrorists arriving from the coast, this has become an important aspect from the security point of view as well. There was reference to the code for unplanned encounters at sea, which has been mentioned in the uh, thing. no discussions have taken place but i suspect that it would be largely similar to those adopted by the western pacific naval symposium which finalized its 2014 document in qingdao uh, so i think the queues system yes i think it's a very useful thing but i'm not sure whether we have reached that point but yes um, uh, this is something which we should learn uh, from another experience now in conclusion i would like to say that cooperation between india and china in the indian ocean region cannot be separated from the framework of our difficult security relations across the land border we've just had a discussion uh, on the land border issue various points were raised i also wanted to raise some points i have actually in fact just finished a book dealing with that uh, particular uh, period and um, it it is something which as ambassador nambia pointed out has had a kind of a paradigm shifting development as far as india is concerned as it is you know the speed with which the pla navy arrived in the indian ocean region has been a bit disconcerting and i'll say this frankly as this has happened uh, we've been noticing we know that uh, the pla navy had been sending regular task forces to fight somali piracy uh, but now piracy is almost gone but the task force is still going so they are probably more of training missions for the plan uh, i think this year the 37 task force has gone since 2014 we have seen pla warships uh, submarines making port calls i think this is not in itself not an issue we do have a problem of course with pakistan and gwadar uh, because we have a certain problematic relationship with pakistan so gwadar is something which does create a certain amount of uh, tension in india otherwise whether it is djibouti hamban tota chaopio in myanmar they are not really viewed with military concern the indian navy has a strong presence in the two northern quadrants of the indian ocean region it's a pretty strong navy india's geography is also an obvious asset from the point of view of security so as i said individual bases and all that that may may come up or facilities that may come up i in themselves not security issues you may find that a lot of media discussion but i don't think you should go by that now over the years india has built up important networks with regional countries like mauritius seychelles australia indonesia singapore oman uae 
uh, as well as extra regional powers who operate in the region like the US and France. And I suspect that the Indian Navy would love to work with the PLAN in ensuring the security and stability of the IOR. The problem is that Sino-Indian relations right now are in a state of flux because of the problems relating to the land border. I know there are many in China who say we must separate the issue of the border issue from the larger bilateral relationship. But I'll be very frank, I don't think that is possible. I think the time has come to fix Sino-Indian relations and that's the point that has been made previously also in this discussion. And the boundary issue must become uh, part of that. Whether we, 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 we uh, Ambassador Nambiar's suggestion has given a suggestion on the uh, fixing of the LAC. Uh, there have been other, I think Mr. Xian Feng, uh, who's going to speak, has also, I think, written about border zones, border uh, creating um, no patrol zones or border zones. So many ideas are there, but we need to fix this. Unless we fix this, I don't see uh, this, uh, the naval cooperation happening. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I understand that it's difficult really for each every person to talk just for, for about five minutes. Huh? Uh, but uh, yeah, things have been going on so well with uh, the conflict so substant substantive. Now, Jimbo, please. Oh, yes. Uh, good morning, dear friends, dear India friends, Professor Chopo and Professor Didi and Professor Dave. Yes, thank you for inviting me for this one committee. Yes. Now, the current China India relations are not at the lowest level in the last three years. The unfortunate border has been the, yes, the conflict accident one year ago had a serious impact on our bilateral relations. Uh, I do not want to say yes, this happened to attach great importance to every dialogue opportunity with India exports, scholars, and friends. I sincerely yes, want to restore the trust step by step and strengthen, strengthen the understanding step by step and recall the memories and feelings as good before the board confrontation. I think today's topic is very, uh, very good and very meaningful. Yes. Now, because we, we, are, we talk about the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean, just as its name implies, China and India, which also explain for the last thousand years why the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean are called this name. There's no accidental, I think. In my opinion, first, yeah, when we are the largest country in the two regions, respectively. And second, we have the natural lead, yes, for interest in the, these two mar maritime regions. And third, from the geographical security perspective, it also identifies how special, how sensitive to our two countries. Uh, Mr. George just mentioned many uh, frank uh, views, yes. I think it also represents the mainstream view of India's strategy, so-called now. Uh, please allow, allow me to summarize this yes, very briefly. Yes. The first, yeah, the Chinese Navy has developed rapidly and aggressively yes, in recent years, especially in South China Sea. The second, China is expanding its military influence to the Indian Ocean, posing increasing challenge to India interests. A uh, third, through maybe through the BRC, yeah, uh, BRI, yeah. China has strengthened the relations with some countries in the Indian Ocean, deepened its presence in the Indian Ocean, and made India, yes, uh, more alert, uh, more alert, yeah, more sensitive. I believe uh, the Indian scholars also, yes, what you know, yes, what is mainstream China scholars' view of, about India's intentions and actions in the South China Sea. Uh, basically, yes. I think the answer is a bit the same as I said above. But the difference is just the replacing China from India and the changing the world from the Indian Ocean to the South China Sea. Why? So I think uh, this is not a great coincidence. It reflects a few serious problems. The first, the China and India are in a period of writing. Both are the major powers in Asia. Both sides have the need to safeguard and consolidate 
the sovereign rights and the security and development interest. And for example, yes, with China, yes, increasing dependence on the oil in the Persian Gulf, the China attached more attention to the security in the maritime energy access to the India region. Also, for example, yes, under the guidance of the uh, East Action Policy, the, yes, the Modi government is more and more sensitive to the navigation freedom and the trade channel security, yes, through the South China Sea. And then I think second, the maritime issue is a continuation of the lack of, the lack of strategic mutual trust between us. At present, new problems and all the contradictions combined. Whether China and India or India is more concerned about each other's every move, every action. It's very evident last year both competition, yes, uh, reflected in the maritime issue. India believes that China is building a maritime per care to surround India. And uh, China is also unhappy with India's participate in the court security mechanism. Yeah. Uh, third, I think the, now the third parties, yes, influence increasing. Here, I would like to remember, uh, remind, yeah, the China's maritime port chain strategy. Yes, that, yes, that uh, world was invented by the U.S. and it is also Washington. Yes, yeah, is the first countries to openly accusing China living aggressive in the South China Sea. And uh, but in reality, yes, uh, I think India friends know, yes, how the Indian Navy surrounded by the China Navy in the Indian Ocean. And also have the Indian merchant ships be blocked and harassed and detained by Chinese Navy in South China Sea. And uh, recently, whose warship did not respect and invade the India special economic zone this year, yeah. The answer, I think, is very clear. So now the problem is in China, India, to build a maritime trust measures. I think definitely we must. Now we have a lot of similarities in maritime issues. First, yes, usually in the past, we are maritime powers for a thousand years, yes. Yeah. And second, we are major countries with both land and sea and need comprehensive consultation of security and the development in land and sea. In history, yes, both of the countries, we have been invaded by the sea and have a serious pain in the Western country diplomacy. The mm -hmm. third Sorry, that Yes, we have also have a considerable concerns of the UN Commission law, yes, the sea law. And of course, the most important economical zone areas of our two countries is located in the coastal areas. So I, on this topic, I have carefully, yes, also carefully, yes, and again and again, yes, checked the relevant cooperation documents, official documents signed by the government and the army during the last 20 years. Among them, the maritime cooperation, I think, has been clearly mentioned many times, such as Lateral corporations, maritime security, and the maritime research and the environmental protection, and strengthened cooperation in the Gulf, yes, uh, yes, and the Somalia, yes. Joint maintain international navigation safety and then navigation freedom. And they also respond to the unconventional maritime security threats. I think, yes, also have a joint uh, maritime uh, navy exercise and anti-piracy corporations. Yeah. yeah, in addition, I think the, the, uh, my final words, uh, the, uh, this memories, uh, the India yes, Minister yes, uh, Shankar yes, said India-China relations at, at the crossroad and, and the choice of two countries will have a far-reaching impact on both sides, but also on the whole world. And a civilized, civilized countries like India, China must always take a longer yes, view. Yes. I appreciate his work very much. Yes. I think this is also the meaning of today's dialogue. We should grasp 
yes, every opportunity, yes. We should, yes, communicate, yes, yes, to uh, 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 misunderstanding, intense trust, yes, to promote peace. So thank you. Uh, uh, now, okay, we, we, we don't have many minutes left, but now the floor is open for discussion, please. Well, maybe I can uh, uh, just uh, say uh, uh, one minute. Uh, I fully agree with the Bonner Judge that China has natural interest in the, in the ocean, but uh, we, China and the India, do not have conflicts of interest in the Indian Ocean. Yes, you mentioned, uh, actually from your attitude, I see a kind of ambivalence. When you first mentioned that China's uh, activities is concerning, but then you said that uh, Chinese uh, presence is not viewed with concern. This kind of ambivalence is exactly what I believe to be typical Indian attitude towards PLA's presence in the Indian Ocean. The point is that PLA is there, uh, first and foremost, for counterparty operation. And uh, we actually have a uh, cooperation with you, along with some other 25 uh, international navies. Uh, so in the Indian Ocean, China's interest, China has a legitimate interest but it does not affect India's interest because uh, China's position when it comes to maritime issue is actually more in line with India's policy. You talk about free and open Indo-Pacific, but your position actually is more in line with China's because you and, and China have the same reservation for the same article, Article 298 of UN UNCLOS, right? And you do not allow <clears throat> for uh, military exercises in your EZ without the consent of the Indian government when it involves ammunition and explosive. And in China's law, actually, we do not have such a harsh restriction for, for foreigners. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, on land border issue, we have problems. But in the Indian Ocean, we have no problem. And uh, India uh, actually talks a lot about the stream of poetry, which was coined by uh, American defense contract, uh, Mr. Hamilton, but until now, so many years have passed, we only have one of his supply station in Djibouti. That does not suggest in the future we'll end up with just the one, but that certainly suggests that we would not have a big uh, three no pose, right? So, talking about the queues, yes, I think maybe uh, with uh, PLS uh, increased the activities in the Indian Ocean, and with your uh, increase the activities in the uh, uh, South China Sea in line with your <clears throat> at the East policy, maybe we could uh, uh, start to discuss about the rule of, a, of a, the engagement yeah, between our, our two countries, even in the Indian Sea, because I know, uh, you know, in the Western Naval Peace Symposium, as well as in IONS, the accused is already adopted. Thank you. Uh, forgive me, if just if I may, just one, Manoj, just before you uh, before you respond, I just want to check one question of to you: Is there any standing? Maybe it's because of my ignorance. Is there any standing mechanism for regular consultations between the navies of the two countries? Thank you. I don't think so. I think there was a maritime uh, dialogue which had been proposed. Maybe it had one. Uh, Maybe it had one sitting, if I'm not mistaken. Probably uh, Ambassador Kanta may have a better idea. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, I, I confirm that is correct. Okay. Okay, well, uh, you know, the point I'd like to make is exactly what uh, Senior Colonel Zhou is saying. That is that uh, Chinese activity as such, it's fairly minor in the sense there are some ships and some submarines, uh, some uh, port and berthing facilities completely understandable. And I think the Indian Navy doesn't really worry about all that. And as I mentioned only obliquely uh, was Gwadar because of Pakistan, because we have a difficult relationship with Pakistan. I'll be very frank uh, about that. So we uh, have to uh, factor it uh, into account. But as far as the other areas are concerned, they're not, you know, if you want to have port and berthing facilities in different places, uh, that's fine. The issue is, the point I was trying to make was that with difficult relations across the land border, the potential that we have for cooperation in the maritime area is not being met. 
because of the land border difficulties that we uh, we confront. And as I explained that already, China is an observer in ions. It's an, uh, ob uh, it's an observer in the Indian Ocean Rim Association. So all the, all the elements are there for a closer cooperation. All the elements are there, we, they, we, they, the institutions are there. Uh, the issue is, and I think um, uh, Mr. Chan Feng uh, made out that point also, the question of building mutual trust. I think the issue really is right now, uh, I'll be very frank, is the very complicated and difficult situation along the land border. So the, uh, the maritime part of it is the least of the problems, meaning the, the, in the Indian Ocean, you know, given India's geographical centrality, there's nothing that we feel insecure with regard, uh, you know, because of China. There's no, no cause for us to be insecure. We have a pretty good network of friends uh, <coughs> and a and, uh, uh, good cooperation uh, system there. Uh, the issue, again, uh, to, to, to come back to the point, is the land border. Okay, any, any other comments from any other people? Okay, let me just uh, use one minute to, to make a response to uh, your remarks. First of all, I just think uh, about the country. That is because we have the problem on the land border, we should make our cooperation elsewhere as large as possible. Since we do not have uh, much uh, over uh, a conflict of interest in the Indian Ocean, and we have uh, excellent cooperation in counter-piracy. That is a perfect example of how we might cooperate uh, uh, there. You see, the Indian media always complain about the PLA's presence in the Indian Ocean. And uh, the Chinese media seldom complain about uh, your ship's activities in the South China Sea. That is a fact. And uh, yes, you mentioned the Paris now and now. But China has a tremendous interest in the security and safety of sea lane and in the safety and security of about one, one million Chinese people working in the rimland of the Indian Ocean. And China's, uh, China's interests now are everywhere as the largest exporter, second largest importer, and are the largest trade nation in the world. So therefore, I believe uh, we too could have uh, a lot of uh, interaction and cooperation at the sea. Thank you. Right, if uh, there, is, there are no more problems that were just uh, on time, uh, let me come to uh, the, uh, the third session of how China might help or cooperate with India in fighting COVID-19. Uh, with this, let me invite first of all Dr. Uh, Mandurima Nandi to start. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to this webinar organized by the Center for International Security and Strategy, Shinghua University. I thank Senior Colonel Chopo uh, and his colleagues for the invitation to discuss this important question of the scope of health cooperation between China and India, which is an often neglected issue given the geopolitical tensions that have aggravated in the last year. There's a need for closer dialogue on a pragmatic basis to restore some normalcy and give space to other important issues like health security that's plaguing the region. Humanity has gone through a deep crisis since the beginning of last year and uh, many nations have been ravaged. Much could have been achieved sooner with greater cooperation and transparency between nations. In the past, health agreements that have been between India and China have been very fragmented and incremental. In the last one year, both India and China have provided aid to each other and the world. When the crisis began in Wuhan, India had sent out medical equipments to China. More recently, when India went through with devastating second wave, China offered to help. It was also individual Indian and Chinese companies striking deals for oxygen tanks and personal protective equipment who came forth to help. Having said this, uh, government to government cooperation has been limited and much of the response has been in the form of providing aid during a crisis. This surely needs a more move towards a more sustained response on epidemic preparedness and containment of infectious diseases in the region, not just during outbreaks and epidemics, but also out of it to prevent it from occurring in the first place. 
At a global level, both India and China are part of multilateral initiatives, and in the last decade, both have emerged as donors for development assistance for health to many low-income countries. The burden of diseases, infectious and non-infectious, is significantly high in India and China and in the region. There is much that can be achieved in working together to prevent, detect, treat, and manage diseases. There are several ways in which these engagements can occur. This might include cooperation in need for better disease surveillance and tracking in the region, risk mitigation strategies, and more importantly, research and development in the area that both countries can collaborate in, firstly in medicines and secondly in medical technology. Given the respective strengths and weaknesses, there is much to be learned from each other. For instance, we not only need to strengthen our, our own generic pharmaceutical industries, but also negotiate with aggressive patent regimes so that medicines are accessible to not only our population, but also to the low-income countries in the region and across the world. This would definitely make a difference at the global level and help build strong relations between nations. Also, research and development in medical technology for diagnosis and treatment is another area. So there can be learnings from innovations in technology, drugs, best practices, and public health management that have emerged as a success in the given context, but possible, there might be possibilities of replicability. Also, collaborative research studies could be conducted between India and Chinese institutions from a public health perspective that could then feed into our health security policy framework. Even as bilateral initiatives, it is imperative to understand strategies to control existing and silent epidemics like tuberculosis, malaria, that account for high mortalities and morbidities in not only India and China, but also in the region. Health security, I feel, should be well integrated within foreign policy, given the transnational character of the spread of infectious diseases. A broader sustainable policy on health security in the region to mitigate spread of infectious diseases must be integrated within the regional cooperation framework and cooperating in health and well-being would also contribute to the United Nations sustainable development goals. There is ample scope to have dialogues and cooperate in the health sector, but for this to proceed, our geopolitical tensions need some mitigation and we must return to some modicum of normalcy to even start with these dialogues. It is important to mutually recognize the importance of health security as imperative to human development and prioritize it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nandi. Uh, I think this is fascinating. An area I seldom think of, but this is so fascinating. We can further discuss about all this issue during time uh, for discussion. Now, please, uh, Professor Lili from Tsinghua University. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my uh, great honor to join this event, and I'm very happy to see so many uh, old friends uh, from India. And uh, of course, I'm also happy to be with my colleagues here in Tsinghua. Uh, actually, uh, I think, uh, first of all, I would uh, like to say uh, uh, we Chinese are very happy that um, uh, the pandemic situation uh, have been improved and stabilized uh, in India. So uh, I uh, wish, uh, personally, I wish all my friends uh, uh, to stay uh, safe. And uh, I think uh, today I pick up <laughs> a little bit, uh, you know, uh, easier question uh, you know, in this dialogue. But when I look at the issue, I think um, uh, it's not easy. Uh, because I think uh, this question also, as, uh, just as um, uh, Madrima uh, touched upon, uh, this uh, cooperation on, uh, you know, the COVID-19 fight actually is much more affected by our political uh, ties. So uh, the first point uh, I just uh, uh, would like to uh, uh, share with you a, a few points. The first one is that just as uh, uh, Madurima mentioned, the cooperation ha has been there uh, since uh, the uh, uh, the, co uh, the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, you know, uh, 
we appreciate very much uh, when uh, we were hit by the pandemic in Wuhan, uh, Indian, uh, you know, sent your assistance to uh, China. And when the second uh, wave uh, hit India, the Chinese government in the first place uh, expressed its willingness to help. Uh, China had provided 100 uh, oxygen concentrators, 40 ventilators, other supplies and one uh, million dollars in cash assistance to India this time through the uh, Red Cross Society of China. Uh, this is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, assistance uh, from uh, NGO, you know, in China. Uh, so uh, what I would like to point here is that this kind of cooperation uh, on the uh, uh, COVID-19 fight uh, up to now actually is an uh, indication of our political uh, relations because uh, it's, uh, you know, why uh, actually uh, there are big potentials for our uh, cooperation on this issue. Uh, but uh, the cooperation is very limited. And according to my understanding, India in the past uh, did not accept uh, official aid uh, from foreign countries. But this time, due to the severity of the pandemic, India started to you know, change the policy. But India, you know, uh, uh, didn't give uh, a response from the Chinese offer of uh, official aid. So this uh, is uh, my observation. But uh, however, I think the even the restrained uh, cooperation uh, in the COVID-19 fight still carries significant political message. Uh, you know, when the t at a time when the border standoff has not been resolved and the mutual trust is severely challenged, the COVID-19 fight actually provides an arena for China and India to communicate and improve their relationship. The cooperation, uh, even though restrained, represents the goodwills of both sides. Uh, you know, the, the recent BRICS joint statement indicates the common grounds of the emerging economies in fighting against the pandemic. So the question is uh, not how, but if uh, we can, you know. Uh, I think it's again, depends on the involvement of our uh, political relations. In my personal opinion, if China and India cannot become uh, friends, at least we should not become enemies. Uh, it is in neither interest. When the political tie, uh, ties are still intense, we can start cooperation in the COVID-19 fight from the easier uh, to the more complex one. So uh, here are my some uh, suggestions. First, uh, we should strengthen cooperation and coordination in the multilateral uh, institutions. So I, I think it's the, <laughs> It's much more easier for us. You know, we can strengthen vaccine cooperation based on the BRICS and the RIC cooperation. I know uh, you have uh, already have the bilateral cooperation with Russia, so maybe uh, we can expand to the trilateral and then expand to the uh, BRICS, uh, you know, level. Uh, and uh, uh, health officials and pharmaceutical industries should meet and find how to provide vaccine to developing uh, countries through uh, joint manufacturing, still on the multilateral level first. And second, China and India should explore vaccine cooperation in South Asia and Southeast Asia. They are our shared neighborhood. Uh, to bring the pandemic to an earliest end, it requires a coordinated and regional solution. So I think that actions benefiting the regional COVID-19 fight and healthy competition should be welcomed and encouraged. Last uh, but not the least, China and India should start uh, a health dialogue. They can exchange experiences and explore co cooperation in a third country uh, and cooperation COVID-19 fight can be also you know, translate it into a CBM. Yeah, thank you. Mm, thank you, Lili. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation as well. 
to focus in a special, very complicated area for both sides. Now the floor is open for question and answers. Maybe, maybe my colleague Dali or oh, Ambassador Nambia. Could just I say just that? wanted to. I just wanted to uh, thank you very much, uh, Colonel. I just wanted to mention that uh, I was very, uh, very, uh, in fact, very impressed by uh, Professor Lili's mention that we can't have, we can't be friends. At least let's not be enemies. That's very important, I think. And the. The it's question my of uh, yeah, it's my personal, uh, you know. You no, know, absolutely. I think it's uh, uh, and also the reference to multilateral cooperation uh, through BRICS and also vaccine cooperation. I think these are these are very important uh, uh, suggestions, and I think it is important for us to uh, to look at it very seriously. Uh, this will also go through a whole series of there is a whole series of perceptions that are growing inside the country, which is actually being fed by a series of uh, of uh, half truths and uh, and rumors, which need to be, in a sense, uh, uh, addressed. Now, I was thinking of just one question to both either Madhurima or to uh, Professor Didi, and that is the impact of COVID on the student interaction between India and China. There are a, such a large number, twenty three thousand students, which go to uh, China, and they the health pan, the pandemic and the health crisis has actually had a critical uh, kind of uh, impact on uh, their going. How do we work in a manner which helps to ease that kind of thing? There are obviously certain protocols that are needed to be adhered to. There are concerns of public health on both sides, which are, which are absolutely uh, necessary to be, uh, to be addressed. But at the same time, uh, they should be used in a manner which in sense facilitates, and just as you said, a health dialogue can be a CBM. The fact that we continue to have these students, I think is a very important aspect of keeping the, the kind of level of our interactions at a, at a modicum, which is at least not uh, negative. It's, we, we need to see that this, uh, this interaction uh, is sustained. Uh, if anybody could, can't, uh, could uh, explain some way, some way in which we can go forward on this. May I? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, Ambassador Nambia, uh, you know, your point is very important. You touch on very important issue because uh, currently, uh, you know, the, 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 the atmosphere or the climate uh, between uh, us is not so well. It's very sensitive. Uh, it's at a very sensitive stage. If we cannot deal with those very, uh, it seems very, uh, you know, concrete issue, uh, well, it will, you know, deepen our, uh, you know, uh, mistrust. So I think it is very important to look after those issues, especially for those uh, students, uh, how to solve their uh, personal concerns. Uh, the problem here is that uh, we are using different approaches uh, in dealing with this uh, pandemic. You know, China has been following a very uh, strict rules uh, to yeah. control uh, this pandemic uh, spread. So I think uh, that's why I, I think we have to have this kind of uh, health dialogue or some other dialogue to deal with these concrete, uh, concrete issues, uh, to uh, first to talk with each other and uh, uh, to facilitate uh, finally, I think the purpose is to uh, how to uh, find a way to facilitate uh, those students uh, how to uh, make their learning uh, you know sustainable yeah yeah i just want to add something uh, uh, basically there is number of students uh, who are going to china most of them are studying medicine in china most of them are spread across provinces in China and in various uh, state and private universities, uh, medical universities within China. And uh, in fact, their concern has been, and a lot of them, since we had done our study, one of our studies is focused on uh, looking at these Indian students who are studying in China. Uh, I've been receiving a lot of uh, messages and uh, you know, concern that uh, they have been unable to return back and continue with their studies. So somewhere I feel the, people to people kind of engagement that continues, whether it's through education or such, uh, you know, exchanges between 
companies where we are helping out each other that should be, that should continue despite the fact that uh, there are tensions within the political realm and uh, you know disputes there but uh, somewhere uh, we need to actually understand that these interactions are important and uh, need to be sustained and and probably uh, such disruptions in their uh, education and uh, you know interaction can be avoided so uh, is there a way out of this thank you thank you ms landy any other comments uh, yes i have uh, one question for in your friends yeah i have one question yes please oh okay okay yeah okay yes <clears throat> Uh, I, I, yes, I always think, yes, I would always think, yes, the COVID-19 pandemic yes, is a, currently, yes, is a good opportunity to, to stabilize the kind of issues. But, but really, yes, the kind of, especially the China social media question, why did, why did India government and the public opinion and also the media, media level, do not show any Corresponding, uh, corresponding positive attitudes. Yes. So, can the Indian press explain it to me? Yeah. Mm. Well, I think this is a good question, but it goes beyond uh, uh, science and technology into politics, right? Anybody uh, from Indian side could answer this question? Yes. Uh, look. Uh, may I add well, one point, uh, you know, uh, I actually, uh, uh, my sense is that, uh, you know, uh, I totally agree with uh, Madhu Rima's uh, point that we should strengthen our people to people contacts in terms of the Indian students who are learning in uh, medical uh, they are, you know, at the very beginning, there are some kind of uh, reports uh, from the Indian media that these students uh, seem uh, getting some kind of discrimination in India because uh, their diploma will not be, uh, you know, accepted in India. So I just wonder uh, how is the situation right now? This. Uh, questions actually is very much related to uh, Professor Chen Feng. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm. I mean, if I can answer that, I mean, much I of this much is much again, yeah. <laughs> much of uh, this has also been, I mean, about mutual trust. I mean, that's where we kind of need these people to people interactions more because uh, when we had spoken to some of these students back in China and uh, interviewed them at length, it was quite fascinating to hear their stories and their experiences in China because they had a lot of positive things to say too. So it wasn't always like, you know, you have, you're not happy or, or you know, I mean, they had quite a few things to, in fact, uh, say and their interactions with the Chinese in general in their day-to-day -day lives. I mean, so those things were quite fascinating and we had in our report uh, put out these recommendations that these uh, interactions, you know, should continue and probably quality of the education needs to be monitored by the state governments itself. So you have like the Chinese state also looking into these curriculums of universities providing, uh, you know, separate courses to foreign uh, students in medicine. And similarly, India, once the students come back, like how do they actually, uh, you know, how do we evaluate them in that sense? And that should be common for everyone. I mean, not just for students coming for, from China. So there has been some kind of a policy dialogue that's been happening. Uh, but we are yet to see how it takes shape, yeah. If I may make one, just one point which is slightly subjective and, and perhaps it's an opinion and I hope it, within India, I think particularly in the past few months after the political dif difficulties that we've had, there's been a, a very, in a sense, a, a wave of impressions, uh, highly, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, highly nationalistic, but at the same time, a very strong emotional current has actually impacted on the general attitude within the public towards even students and things like that. I think uh, that inevitably 
uh, is a wave. It will come and go. I would like to think that it will come and go. And these things happen very often, partly they are reflection of uh, sensitivities, uh, which are actually sometimes manipulated by interested, uh, you know, interests, uh, lobbies, etc. And I think that is inevitable. But the cure for that, I agree with Madhurima, is to actually keep the, uh, the at least to keep uh, the process of exchanges going, and perhaps to you know you, to support those who are seeking to continue their exchanges and eventually just ride over the storm. I don't think that there is, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, the uh, you know, public uh, reactions like this happen everywhere. And I think to some extent, it's a very fickle kind of response. Uh, we'll have to be able to look at a slightly more longer term in order to be able to, uh, you know, to have, and here questions like uh, what Professor Lilia said about uh, having a health dialogue, uh, I think will probably help to clear the air also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Nam Namdia. Any other comments? Well, let me, uh, maybe I can say a few words. When I listen to this conversation from beginning until now, what I strongly felt is that we two countries are really developing countries. Why? Because the way we talk the way we talk about how political trust is important uh, is or how this kind of uh, conflict has affected by that relationship really reminds uh, me of the similarity in our mentality. Because the similar thing is true when we come to China-US relationship, the Chinese would ask for political trust but Americans would very much say, uh, without transparency, how can we trust each other? Uh, so my personal feeling is that uh, of all relationship, probably professionalism is needed. And such a professionalism uh, is, uh, is needed and could be expanded, especially in this new identified area. Uh, of uh, pharmaceutical uh, potential pharmaceutical cooperation. Actually, a few years ago, a film is quite popular in China, which tells how some uh, Chinese people uh, desperate to cure certain disease would go to India to find medicine, which is uh, cheaper and also trustworthy. So this uh, film is a sensation in China. It brings to Chinese people uh, a kind of a realization of how developed India is in pharmaceutical industry. Uh, you see, when, we, when I talk about how we might have this particular area of cooperation, it reminds me of some cooperation which we did with the United States in this area. The problem is China and the United States always have a, a lot of problems and more problems than between China and India. So we tried painstaking efforts to find areas of cooperation, which is limited. But one of them turned out to be joint efforts in addressing Ebola, even in Africa. So Chinese medical people and American medical people simply work in the same a laboratory. And this is often cited as an example of a cooperation, almost the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, when we come to this area of cooperation between China and India, my memory would go down even to the Second World War, when Dr. Uh, Ellis yeah, was sent to China to help Chinese uh, soldiers in fighting against the Japanese. So, but my uh, other concern is uh, about competition. Because China is also a big country in uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, manufacturer, and so is India. So could we really have a cooperation rather than competition? But uh, I think of what uh, uh, Professor Nani has suggested, uh, that uh, we might have cooperation in uh, uh, policy research or uh, among institutions. But my general feeling is, is this is really, really an area 
where we could have a lot of cooperation. India buys a lot of raw materials from China. And this kind of, uh, you know, complementary relationship is so evident. So there, there are plenty of plenty of uh, potential areas that we need to explore. My general feeling for something that I really don't know. Thank you. All right, uh, if we do not uh, have uh, more uh, questions, uh, let's proceed to the final session. The future of Quad and India's role in it, or how India-US relationship might evolve and its implication for China. Maybe it's vice versa, the other side is also true. Uh, we have a two sides of the same coin. So with this subject, uh, we have uh, Dr. Hammond Alaka, uh, to go ahead first, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Senior Colonel Chaupo. Uh, my greetings to uh, you uh, and to my co-panelists from the Chinese uh, side, Professor Chen Feng, uh, Professor Li Li, and of course, my co-panelist in this session, uh, Professor Tawe, who is also a good friend of mine. Uh, with these words, uh, let me pick up from where I stopped uh, with my question in the first session. And as we have heard in all the previous sessions, and as has been also emphasized uh, by some of the speakers, uh, at least from the Indian side, uh, that uh, the land dispute between the two countries is an overarching, uh, uh, overbearing um, uh, issue or influence on all other aspects of the bilateral relationship. And so, uh, it, so it is uh, in, in the, on the topic we are going to discuss in this session, the dynamics of Quad or Indo-Pacific or the PLA presence in the Indian Ocean region, et cetera. And as I had said earlier, that uh, <clears throat> the three factors which I had pointed out earlier, these three factors continue to uh, either define or obstruct any kind of uh, positive or uh, cooperative uh, approaches between the two countries. Even if we leave aside the core dimensions, for uh, earlier, uh, Dr. Manoj Joshi and uh, Professor Chen Feng had talked about the PLA presence in the Indian Ocean region, et cetera. So uh, my first point is that just like scholars in China, they discount and disagree with the Indian perceptions that the BRI, for example, or the pre-BRI Chinese uh, expanding presence in the Indian subcontinent is essentially directed at intimidating India or blocking or obstructing India's economic growth, et cetera, et cetera. Likewise, scholars in India do not subscribe to the Chinese view that the growing Indo-US relationship in its entirety is either India actively or proactively joining the US-led alliance in the region to contain China. So uh, uh, it's, not, it's not true. And the fact is that uh, India, I mean, Quad, of course, is a loose alliance, which is basically for political uh, uh, coordination and consultation, et cetera, et cetera, and not a serious uh, uh, military uh, grouping together to contain China or to uh, balance aggressive uh, Chinese expansion in the region, et cetera, et cetera. The Americans might be saying it, but India has never uh, participated in such pronouncements. Uh, that is one. My second point is that uh, China's aggressive actions in territorial disputes with its neighbors, irrespective of uh, escalating tensions between China and the US, I mean, this, this point has to be emphasized that even, even when there is or there was no such level of high level of or extreme level of tensions between China and the US, China has been behaving very aggressively in its territorial disputes with its neighbors. And, and that makes the world, including China's neighbors, wonder if the rapidly rising China has finally embarked on a brazen all out campaign for regional and even global domination as the upcoming new hegemonic power? That is a question which needs to be addressed. And third, 
if this is how china chooses to play or continue to play century of humiliation victim card on one hand and aggressively resort to bullying behavior against neighbors in order to resist or challenge the us determination to isolate china on the other hand then i think china needs to do some serious introspection simply because i hope china is aware that countries especially in its neighborhood are increasingly feeling threatened by china's uh, behavior aggressive behavior especially more recently and finally china's overall objective is as it has been in the last four decades to achieve economic development and economic prosperity for its people now having surpassed the us economy in ppp terms and being the world's leading manufacturer and trader sustained economic growth and prosperity is what is the meaning of the chinese dream therefore china must display the ability to think out of the box for example outwit the us by creating international and diplomatic pressures by taking initiatives such as one dial down the rhetoric and de escalate military build up in the region especially on the island chains and reefs in the south china sea second display its superior traditional military and strategic culture and skills and restore status quo ante in eastern ladakh and three last but not the least as president xi recently called for china to make friends and win over the majority i think this was said uh, on 31st may in a meeting top level meeting by president xi yeah. then china must avoid as in the words of a former indian ambassador to peking uh, ambassador vijay gokhale who had said that china must avoid a one size fits all approach in its behavior with neighbors and in its diplomacy or else despite the good intentions but due to the lack of better communication china runs the risk of being called what is a popular hindi saying uh, bad se badnam bura or in rough english and chinese translations it means that bad image is worse than bad name in chinese maybe if i can roughly translate is that huai xin xiang bi huai ming zi geng zao gao thank you uh thank you hemond uh, uh for your uh personal description about chinese behavior especially towards your neighbor and uh thank you for your good chinese huh? that is a uh, quite a <laughs> impressive indeed yeah and now let me invite uh, professor dawe one of the uh, best uh, uh american study chinese uh, professor in china to talk about this uh, very important issue dawe please yes okay uh thank you uh senior canal joe and uh, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting discussion i as uh, our chair introduced i i am actually by no means a sino india um, researcher probably this is the uh, the first time i i attend a sino india relation discussion in my whole life uh, <laughs> <laughs> so very very interesting i learn a lot Um, I think uh, Senior Knau, uh, Joe already uh, pointed out, and I agree with him um, 100%, that uh, we need uh, some kind of professionalism in our bilateral relations and also in both of our two countries' foreign policies. Um, here, I think when we re um, discuss the uh, India, US, or Quad, or China, India, uh, the US, those trilateral things, I will say uh, we particularly need some kind of uh, professionalism here. I think two things. One is um, let, let's view it from a trilateral uh, perspective, China, US, India, these three countries. Um, I think, of course, uh, China and the U.S., I, I think I had an uh, honor to speak on this topic twice with ICS. I think China and the U.S. are entering a 
new era, uh, which uh, I think competition is the major character. So we don't have much choice now. Uh, I think China and the US two countries will compete uh, or in a, some kind of long-term competition for, for maybe at least one or two decades. So in this uh, situation, uh, what is uh, India's uh, choice? And uh, what is the best choice for India serving the Indian's national interest? I think it's, it's quite clear that is uh, India is a player, um, major player here. And uh, if India stand in between, uh, I think that will serve India's national interest, of course. Um, and I think my, my friend Hammond also uh, say, he reiterate that the, U, the, the India won't join the uh, US effort to try to or, or alliance system to contain China. I think we heard uh, this kind of, uh, this argument a lot from our India friends, but to be honest, uh, I think the concern here in China regarding uh, US uh, India relations uh, has been uh, growing in China. Um, though I, we understand, I think particularly for those scholars, we understand that India have a very long tradition of strategic independence. And we, I think majority of us don't believe that India will abandon that. But, uh, but the problem is the signals we received from our bilateral relations, from our interaction with Indian friends, uh, um, I will say mainly negative. We had a lot of negative developments in our bilateral relations. All those uh, developments, um, no matter who should be blamed, uh, gave many Chinese an impression that is India is um, uh, leaning towards the United States. So, uh, and also join mechanism like Quad to contain China. Uh, I personally don't think that's true, but I'm describing the, uh, the popular perception here in China. I think the problem is we have not received a balanced signal from India. We, we received a lot of negative signals, but we have not received the positive signals from, from the Indian side. Uh, the other perspective is uh, from the perspective of the alliance system, alliance politics uh, in world uh, international relations. I think one thing, if we have professionalism here in our bilateral relations, I think we need to understand that actually um, alliance politics is not a direction of, of international politics. The US actually has not increased or added any single uh, eye line after the end of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, it's not in any country's interest to, to, to in today's uh, world politics, to form some very formal security oriented alliance system. And so I don't think Quad will evolve in that direction, but I think um, some phrase like uh, uh, NATO, uh, small NATO, the NATO in Asia Pacific, this kind of expression, or in Chinese we say uh, this kind of expression I think is misleading uh, both for China, for the for India, and for the United States. I think Quad or Indian uh, so-called the U.S. Indo-Pacific uh, strategy won't evolve into that old-style alliance system because this is not the trend, and the U.S. cannot achieve that goal. And I don't think India will join that kind of alliance system. But um, but again, I think. Um, rhetoric here in China and rhetoric in India and rhetoric in United States gave us a uh, misperception that uh, Quad is evolving towards that, uh, that direction and we will see a smaller NATO here in no matter you call it Indo-Pacific or Asia Pacific. I think that's not very professional. So um, our professionalism has been blocked I want to echo with our previous panelists, uh, blocked by our very negative bilateral, uh, uh, bilateral relations in recent years. So we think, I still hope that uh, 
um, we need to separate those two things. I mean, one level is a bilateral relations. The other level is more strategic level, more, uh, 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 yeah, strategic level, like uh, this quad issue, Indo-Pacific strategy, strategy issue, to separate, separate those two levels, or we will be trapped by this trilateral dispute, the border dispute. Uh, I know it's very, very difficult. I understand our Indian friends' uh, viewpoints that it's, it's impossible to, to, to separate that. But if we were trapped always by this, trilateral, um, uh, bilateral dispute, that, is a tra that will be a tragedy because India and China, we will be the most, two most important country uh, in the world this, this, for this century, but we were just trapped by the border issue. Actually, no one country, I don't think India will invade China. I don't think China will invade India. That's history, that's colonial heritage as uh, Hammond pointed out. So I think the, prof again, to sum up, I think the professionalism is extremely important. Let's separate the bilateral dispute from the more uh, importantly, uh, the strategic level uh, issues. Okay, I will stop here, thank you. Mm, thank you, Professor David. I think uh, uh, in this session, we really have some uh, grand strategic issues in, uh, for, for which everybody can say something. So why don't we invite uh, Ambassador Lambia to say something? I'm sure you have something to say. I'll hold on for the present. Please carry on. Let the others say. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right. Yeah. So Mona Josh, please. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I've done that. You know, uh, I just heard uh, Professor Dawe uh, with a quad, and he says that the signals don't seem very clear. Uh, what I would just urge him is just look at the Prime Minister's speech at the Quad Summit on March 12th. It was an absolutely inconsequential speech. It is just some 10 lines, and he mentions virtually nothing. I think that gives you as clear a signal as you want, you see. Uh, as to uh, the relative lack of importance. And it's the prime minister, you know, if you recollect in the Shangri-La dialogue in uh, uh, 2018, uh, where he made it very clear that we have a very different conception of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we, we look for an inclusive uh, uh, system and we view it from the shores of Africa to the shores of the United States. So just <laughs> saying that if you look at the words that are coming out from India, including, of course, uh, I think earlier, uh, Senior Colonel Shaobo, I think you ma made some reference to Indian uh, naval presence in the South China Sea, which again, to my mind, is fairly inconsequential. Meaning, I don't think the US really needs in India in, uh, for its military posture in the South China Sea. I mean, so we are, uh, if a one or two ships from uh, here go uh, to that region, it's not of any great consequence. The US has an independent and very significant military um, uh, presence uh, in that region. And I don't think it is really dependent. Nowhere in the world does the US really depend on anyone else uh, for its military um, uh, you know, posture. So I think that this is the, the, the quad is a, uh, a new grouping, yes, certainly. It's a new grouping, but it's a very loose grouping, meaning as you can see, it has been stumbling earlier. There used to be no press releases. Uh, you, everyone used to issue separate press release. Then we've reached the ministerial level. Now it's reached a, a summit level. And if you look at the summit level, what does it do? Meaning what it has done is actually broadened its scope, meaning it is spoken of uh, cooperation in the area of technology, in vaccines, in connectivity. So it's broadened its scope and therefore becoming become less of any kind of a military instrument. I do not, I do not see that uh, this thing. And as I said, I mentioned that as far as the US is concerned, it doesn't need India, whether it's in the Indian Ocean or whether it's in the uh, South China Sea. Uh, we are inconsequential uh, in the military uh, equations uh, there. So I would just urge you to look at the prime minister's remarks. They're very, very uh, mundane. They do not say much and um, are fairly modest. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Manoj. 
Uh, Lily, please. Yeah. May I uh, ask a question uh. to our uh, Indian friends? Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, in the past, India is very clear that uh, India does not want to be a, a frontline uh, country in the China-US competition. Uh, but right now, when we look at uh, ground reality, you know, uh, since the uh, this time, uh, you know, uh, the the tension on our uh, border, uh, the U.S. has changed its uh, uh, position, uh, its uh, support uh, India, and provided uh, some kind of uh, uh, support like uh, intelligent uh, intelligence sharing. Uh, and uh, now the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, uh, is um, the US, um, I think it's a major, uh, 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 major vehicle to contain China. And now uh, India is um, very much uh, 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 tilting to uh, the US and join the, the, the court. And, the court is becoming more and more active. So I just wonder if there's a possibility that this, uh, uh, the US in the Pacific strategy uh, will extend from the South China Sea to the Indian Ocean, especially to the Bay of Bengal. And in that sense, uh, you know, with the, we have the land, uh, you know, tension, and if the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, the cooperation, the co uh, cooperation extended to the uh, Bay of Bengal, and India will be in a position uh, of a, uh, you know, frontline uh, country in the emerging China-US competition. All right, so now Ambassador Lambia. Uh, just to point, I think just in response to what Professor Lili has just said, actually India doesn't need to be part of any, fra any framework when it comes to being on the front line because we are on the front line vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, irrespective of whether we have a quad or, or nothing, we still have a front line vis-a-vis -vis China. So if anything, we would need some backing in, if, if not in the front. And you know, in some ways I think uh, it is interesting to know that in 1971, when we had our problems with Bangladesh, the United States had been pressing the, pressing the Chinese, as it now on the record, Kissinger was pressing China to take action, as it were, in a sense, to help, uh, uh, you know, counter what they felt was a threat from, from India against uh, the, the, uh, the Pakistanis. At that time, of course, I think the Chinese would have probably been pushed, but... Obviously, they had also been very careful not to allow that kind of a situation to give rise to any, any kind of action which would push them right in the front. I think there is something which is basically different in, uh, in, in the way in which we have, uh, in a sense, sought to get the support of the United States. Of course, I think it would be... It would be I, do, I think it would be hypocritical to say that we would not seek political support for the United States in this problem we've had with China. Obviously we do. We would like to have their understanding of how we see the argument evolving vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis, uh, vis -vis China. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, but at the same time, whether that actually means that India becomes, in a sense, complicit or part of a larger international strategy vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis China, that I think, uh, I, I don't think India will allow that to happen because our interests are, are, are in a sense different. There may be areas in the Indian Ocean where I think there may be a coincidence of interest, a convergence of interests vis-a-vis -vis what the, what the uh, what the China, what the um, Americans uh, have have in in mind, but if the Chinese see the same to see things in the same way, I think a similar convergence can be worked out with China too. And I think that is the that's in a sense the way in which one would look at uh, at, at least the kind of relationship with India was envisaged in terms of areas of interest, both in terms of the land frontier and in terms of the larger 
uh, maritime interests that India has had. And I think uh, this openness, uh, the willingness to look, which is most clearly expressed in the Shangri-La speech by, uh, by the pr Indian Prime Minister, I think is an expression of how we see this purely in terms of, I, I think we have been fairly open, predictable and transparent in the position. Of course, there will be certain difficulties which we may have, and we will look for political support from uh, other countries in pushing, at least as it were, in pressurizing our, our antagonists, perhaps in this case, China, in trying to get a situation, work out a situation which is more favorable for India. I think that is how we would look at it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mandy. <clears throat> Any other comments? Well, maybe I can say, yes, yes, please, uh, Hammond, if you got it. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I just two quick points uh, to the, to the uh, question which was just being discussed and picking up from where Ambassador Nambiar stopped. You see, uh, as uh, Professor Tawe also uh, mentioned, that if we look at the China, US, India, these triangular uh, equations, let us not forget, whether quad or no quad, let us not forget that China, US, and India, all three are nuclear powers. And I don't think any of these three countries is interested in any kind of a military conflict or escalating of tensions which might lead to that kind of a tension or a remote possibility. That, that one has to keep it in mind, number one. Number two, and I think as you had earlier said, uh, Senior Colonel Chauko, about uh, a certain point which Dr. Manoj Joshi had said about China or PLA in Indian Ocean. I think the same argument can be returned to you uh, with kindness, that it is the problem in the Chinese perceptions. On the one hand, I think many Chinese experts, especially India experts, they are very clear and convinced that since India has been traditionally a very uh, country which maintains an independent foreign policy stance, and they're very confident that India will never be formally part of a front line or part of a US alliance against China in particular, then why are these ambiguities uh, in your mind? On the one hand, you say that they, you are confident India will continue to maintain its independent foreign policy stance. And on the other hand, you're so uh, worried or you're so uh, kind of uh, particular about India joining Quad, which already Ambassador Nambia and Dr. Joshi and many other uh, Indian commentators have been saying time and again, that Quad is not actually a, a military alliance as of now. And it is only a loose coming together of these four countries in which India is actually, India has a very distinct uh, position or role in Quad. That is number one. Number two, Quad, if you look at the four countries, America, of course, is miles away from China, but closer home, out of the remaining three countries, India is the only nuclear power. Neither is Japan nor is Australia. So that is also another reason that, it, as Dr. Joshi had repeatedly pointed out, that if you very carefully follow and look at India's uh, positions or India's statements, whether on the Quad forums or related to Quad. For example, last year, US Secretary of State Pompeo had come to India and India had not joined him in making statements against China. So I think these are the things which should be very clear in anybody's mind in China, that where does India stand, whether it is Quad or whether it is any uh, larger or broader or mini uh, anti-China front led by US where India would be an active part. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hemant, uh, for your comments. Uh, may I just say a few words uh, in response? Uh, first of all, I, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, Hemant's uh, uh, assurance that uh, India would not join uh, United States in containing China. Actually, I have a, a lot of confidence in that, even before this meeting. Uh, as I have written before about the future of Quad, 
I don't believe future, uh, the Quad uh, would have a bright future if it is in the direction of uh, becoming a military coalition or, or uh, anti-China club, because none of you would uh, wish to sacrifice your bilateral relationship with China for the benefit of any other three countries. So I personally, I'm not so worried about uh, Quad becoming a, a mini NATO or what. No, I don't think so. But uh, you're talking about China's relationship uh, of uh, being uh, aggressive or bullying towards its neighbors. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with you, although I, I know what you mean. But let me try to explain a bit. On China's land border, there are 14 countries. And with most of the countries, China enjoy good relationship, right? So we only have uh, some problem with you, with, with, with Bhutan. And uh, yes, we have a, a, a maritime dispute with uh, some, let me stress, some claimants uh, of ASEAN countries, not all of them. But uh, in spite of all this, what you have seen in the South China Sea is that China is not a unique force against any one of them. Maybe you don't know, but let me tell you. Philippines actually is a country that has used the force against China on three occasions, in 2006, 2010, and 2013, by Filipino Coast Guards against the Chinese fishermen from mainland China, from Taiwan, and from Hong Kong. China has never used, you know, used force against any of these claims. Maybe this is an example. Actually, I always ask myself this question. Why would the Filipino Coast Guards dare to shoot at Chinese fishermen? Right? Uh, Filipino, uh, militarily speaking, is never strong. Doesn't that suggest China's uh, consistent restraint in the South China Sea? Well, yes, we did uh, some land reclamation, but that is, is an extension or expansion of the uh, natural maritime feature already. Yeah, on the China, uh, already in China's hand, uh, that is on our territory. So these islands are not considered artificial islands uh, by China. They are considered extension of the uh, natural maritime feature. Uh, then about uh, uh, what uh, uh, Mono Josh said. Remember a few years a few years ago, I sent you one of my opinions. which is entitled "China Goes West and India Act East." So I actually give this opinion for you to have a comment. I want, I always want uh, foreigners to read my opinion and get the impression that this Chinese is not the only writing for China's sake. I, I dare to show any of my opinions to foreigners to show that I try my best to be impartial. Of course, impartiality is very much subjective, but that is what I have been trying to try at my best. And uh, quite a few friends have mentioned the Shangri-La dialogue. Yes, I was there uh, during Prime Minister Modi's speech, in which the whole Chinese delegation, including uh, I myself, uh, was encouraged to hear Prime Minister Modi talking about Indo-Pacific in a natural region. That gave us a relief. And the Chinese delegation has immediately talked to the media about its appreciation of such a statement Actually, before Prime Minister Modi's speech, I was invited as one of the two speakers, along with your Secretary General of BJP, Mr. Madad, to give a, a warm-up speech before Prime Minister Modi's speech. Actually, I never expected to be sitting with such a, such a giant of Secretary General of BJP as the only, uh, as the only Chinese speaker, one of the two to talk with him. But what surprised me is how our speeches are similar. Well, we both stressed about cooperation rather than differences. Now, you see, in my speech, what I said is, India act east and China goes to the west. So surely we're going to interact somewhere, right? Yeah, uh, uh, almost on this, new, uh, on this Silk Road. So this is a historical opportunity for us. And uh, when you talk about uh, non-allies, I really have confidence in, in your policy or in spite of the uh, disturbances uh, in our bilateral relationship. And I actually am thinking uh, in a new light. That is, 
if China and India stick to this policy of non-alliance, this is a unique or combined contribution to world international relations. Because what is the need for the strongest nation on earth to have alliance with other countries? George, from George Washington to President Clinton, uh, um, uh, all the founding fathers of the United States warned against the military alliance. And China, when it was weak, would stick to this policy. And India, when it was not as strong as it is now, stick to non alliance. So why should we change this policy? We should continue to stick to this policy of non alliance. Is this uh, policy of India, I personally do have confidence and never worry about that. So with all these uh, comments, uh, I have come to, to the end of my remarks. Maybe I would give this floor to uh, uh, Ambassador Nambia to say a few concluding remarks. Yeah, you're muted. You're muted, Ambassador. Ambassador, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I have actually just, uh, I think it is Hemant who should be taking this, uh, the floor now because I, it was because he had, he had no radio contact with us that uh, I handled it. So I think I'll just, no, just, no, 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 please just uh, say Ambassador thank you Namia. to everybody and give Hemant the floor. No, no, Ambassador, Nambia, Ambassador Nambia, please uh, continue and conclude with your concluding remarks. I, oh, I urge you, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, Actually, there is very little I need to add to what uh, Senior Colonel Jobo has actually said. In some ways, he has, uh, in a sense, reflected the, uh, the sense of this particular meeting. Uh, I think what is, what, is most, uh, uh, what is most striking from today's meeting, as far as I can see, is how we can be perfectly forthright with each other and yet not have any kind of sense of you know, of uh, bitterness or any kind of sense of rancor that has crept into the conversation. Uh, there is still, there are still very serious elements of confidence that need to be, in a sense, instilled or reinstilled into the relationship. There are various uh, doubts which do creep in in terms of interpretation of specific details, but the sense is there, the feeling is there, and the inclination that uh, that I first uh, mentioned in, the, in the, my opening remarks uh, that was reflected in the senior leader, Mr. Tang Xiaoping's own uh, 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 statements uh, to, the, to the people, in, to the press in general, uh, just before his meeting with uh, Rajiv Gandhi, and which was, in a sense, reflected also in the detailed uh, uh, conversation he had. I think what is most important uh, in any kind of relationship is the question of renewal of that relationship through communication. And I think it is that communication which establishes uh, the freshness in terms of how to reflect changes that take place in, uh, in relationships, as well as in the objective nature of, the, of each uh, party. And at the same time, the need to build a certain confidence, a certain trust. Uh, there has always been uh, a, a kind of a sense of wanting to go forward, but not entirely being sure that we can move forward at the same pace that we would like to, uh, because of some kind of thing that is pulling you back. I think to an extent, this is a reflection of uh, a historical, uh, let's say, uh, a historical what, experience, I would say, because there's just a new book which has come uh, in India, uh, which is by a person who was in the historical division of the Ministry of External Affairs, talking about Nehru. And I think Jawaharlal Nehru, the first foreign minister, in some ways, he had what people called an emotional buildup in the relationship with China, which somebody called a fatal attraction. He actually spoke to his daughter in the 30s saying there is something unknown which brings the two countries together. And to, to an extent, uh, the way in which he dealt with the relationship between the two countries in the 50s, I think reflected a certain 
unreal, an air of unreality in terms of being grounded to uh, the, 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 to be grounded to the realities of the experiences, political experiences of the two countries. And to that extent, I think there was a kind of a sense of trust uh, which had suffered in the course of the experiences of the two countries. And I think we are paying for that now. To some extent, there is always a sense of withdrawal, a sense of uh, unwillingness to push forward, to make an investment, an additional investment in trust in the face of some kind of challenges or shortfalls that we face. I think it is for us to keep trying, to keep working and to keep communicating. And in that sense, I think this meeting has been a very, very important contribution. I'd like to thank you, uh, 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 Senior Colonel uh, Cho, as well as uh, the, uh, the very, very eminent kind of uh, representatives uh, on the Chinese side, uh, Professors Chenfeng, Tawe, as well as Li Li, uh, for the very, very clear, informal, as at the same time, wide ranging comments that they have made. Uh, I think this, this is a good indication uh, of the progress that we've made. You must realize that we are yet few days short of the first anniversary of Galwan. And I think this is going to be still going to hurt very, very strongly in the Indian sensibilities. There is going to be strong words which you will hear in the course of the next few days. I'm sure that you will hear them as you go along. But I think it is important for us to realize that while that is also a reality, that is also a truth, I think it is important for us to recapture, as it were, and reiterate some of the uh, some of the feelings and some of the sentiments and the opinions that we have expressed just now, which is also a reality. And I think it is through the mi mixture of these realities that we hope that a larger relationship of balance can be brought into the uh, dialogue between India and China. Uh, I think with that, I'll thank my own colleagues, uh, uh, Manoj, uh, Hemant, and uh, Madhurima uh, for uh, their contributions and uh, I think I'll hand over the the um, the the, uh, the meeting to you, uh, uh, Colonel Joe. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nambia. I can't agree more with every word of what you said. This meeting, exactly before uh, the one anniversary of the unpleasant uh, conflict, is what uh, we have been thinking. That is through frank and candid exchanges between academics, we might draw better lessons uh, for our futures ahead. I hope this is the uh, first, but not the last uh, meeting between us, between our two great countries. There are so many, so many issues for us to discuss. Neither China nor, the, nor India should look only world conversation with the United States, right? So with, with this and with best hope, let's hope uh, we, we might have the next uh, uh, discussion in the near uh, and foreseeable future. Thank you.